Are Ineos now the team to beat in the Challenger Series or even in the America's Cup overall? Well, no. But they have had a remarkable turnaround in results with two victories today. Maybe the first one against Alinghi was kind of expected, but the extent of the victory, considering Alinghi had really been improving their relatives on other boats, was notable. Then, against Luna Rossa, no one really expected that sort of performance from Ineos, myself included. But the indications that this was coming have been there for quite a long time. And as I've said in several of my analysis reviews to date, Ineos do have the boat speed. You don't have to look much beyond the results and into the details of the performance to see that this has been lurking underneath for a while. For me, the really big change today and the thing that Ineos has been struggling so much with is a high mode. In the general lighter conditions, kind of 7 to 10 knots, they've been having decent VMGs but have lacked this higher mode to hold another boat off. Frequently when they've come off a line even, neck and neck, tracking out to a side, if they are the windward boat then they've been squeezed out into attack early or if they're the leeward boat they've been bounced back and forth into the boundary, hurt on the tack out from the boundary, that sort of thing. I think in the past I've been relatively fairly critical of Ineos and this leads me into another area where I have seen a bit of hope in this campaign, well not even this campaign but just recently um, from the prelims onwards and that is in the communication between Ben and Dylan. Dynamic between the two of them seems a lot more even. I got the sense and we talked about it on this channel in the last cup, there were a few instances where Ben was a bit dismissive of other crew members, whether that was, I can remember two instances off the top of my head, one with Lee McMillan calling distances or relatives to another boat when Ben wanted quiet, and another instance with Giles when he briefly had the helm to make a duck and um, Ben wasn't pleased with the distance he left. And that kind of dynamic discussion of the boat didn't seem completely open. Whereas with Dylan, despite the mistakes that have crept in here and there, the communication seems pretty open and uh, pretty even across the two helms, which I think was a really encouraging sign because they do seem to have quite a difficult boat to sail. It's taken them quite a while to get to grips with it, but they seem to be doing that in quite a good culture compared to previous campaigns. Obviously, I'm not on the inside, I don't know the ins and outs, but that's just how it feels looking at it from an outsider's perspective. So let's have a look at a couple of the pieces in the data and in the, um, and in the footage today, which could hint at Ineos's strong points, but also a word of caution to anyone wanting to jump on a Rule Britannia bandwagon. The most interesting day for me was Thursday. Ineos took two losses on a Thursday, but I commented to a friend, there's not often you take two losses like that and come out the day feeling better. The first loss against American Magic was close. Ineos took the lead but then surrendered it on the last um, run with a dodgy jibe. But when we look at the data from the first race against Magic, which Ineos won, where they were being constantly chased down throughout the, um, throughout the race, USA were off the foils at the gun, Ineos amassed a kind of 700 metre lead, and then it was chased down to barely nothing at the finish. And when we look at the speeds and VMGs, yes, Ineos did have a good VMG, which has always been lurking, but it was pretty much similar to Magic Upwind and a little bit slower downwind in that instance, even if Ineos had moments of good pace downwind in the VMG. But we fast forward to the race that they lost against Magic and those VMGs have switched around and Ineos were going a bit faster upwind and a bit faster downwind as well, despite losing the race. 
but what was still lacking with Ineos was the high mode and I'll show you in the in the race viewer you know Ineos have been constantly getting caught in these sort of scenarios where um, this was actually a pretty sketchy pre-start when they dropped off the fools just got going in time to come off the pin and magic for them outright but Ineos just don't seem to have a high mode so they t do the tack and they just got get killed on the exit of the tack just not being able to claw out from um from that position and their second race of the day was against Emirates Team New Zealand and they got an absolute thumping in this result a thrashing over a almost a mile behind uh, Team New Zealand at the finish but again when you look to the details it wasn't quite so bad they stuck with or kind of maintained the advantage that Team New Zealand had for two of the three laps. And then when you look at the overall trace for wind speed through that race, you can see um, you can see the true wind speed just trending down through the race. And that really killed Ineos. They um, really struggle in those light winds. I think they had a dodgy tack and a dodgy and then fell off the falls at the leeward mark as well. But again, looking at Ineos's weakness, it was this um, this high mode. So again, Ineos come off the start line. I think they had a lead at the start, um, but they going into the boundary. They try to kind of push Team New Zealand off them, but can't hit the boundary and Team New Zealand get them on the exit of the tack. And that was it pretty much race over. But, you know, in the data behind it, they did kind of hold this um, this deficit for two laps um, before falling away with dropping off the foil at Lewin Mark. So, yeah, kind of you have to look beyond the results themselves to really get the story of what's going on in these races. And I felt after those two races that Ineos were really on an upward trajectory despite having a fall off in results from the um, first round robin. I don't think the Ineos fans should be getting too carried away just yet because today's performances where they did have the high mode, in fact just had fantastic VMG upwind and downwind, was in slightly more wind and I think critically waves as well. So Ineos have pretty much said as much that their boat is designed for 10 to 14 knots. This is from the Inside Tack Analysis show, which will be on this evening as well. If you've not been watching this show with Freddie Carr and members of the Ineos team, I think Ian Williams, really good as well, their um, match racing coach. Um, they give really good kind of post-race analysis. It's not like proper punditry. Obviously, it's quite diplomatic for Ineos's perspective, but it's still better than anything else we really get in terms of like post-race punditry um but Ineos did say on this you know Freddie basically speculates that they're designing for I think often these teams get um stuck in a bubble that they believe because they're doing something they believe everyone else sees things the same way and is doing the same thing and I certainly don't believe um that teams like Luna Rossa um and Team New Zealand are designing for 10 to 40 knots. I feel like their sweet spot is a little bit below that, probably for American Magic as well. I think really what we saw today was Ineos getting into their range for the conditions. They have got one of the smallest foils in the fleet and they seem to be using their, their hull, their fuselage, to create a bit of extra um, writing moment using the aerodynamic effects of that which kind of come into their own when it's windier as well and then finally the shape of their bustle I described this as kind of um, muscular and brutalist but they've got this huge voluminous bustle at the front and in the ways we saw it come into its own it's just can crash through punch through those waves on touchdowns a lot a lot better um, so this is when they lost the rudder in the final downwind. There we go, up in the air, down they go, bang. And I really think a lot of other teams would have been fully down the mine there, whereas Ineos are able to um, to carry on, drop their windward foil, collect their thoughts, get the boat up and running again and survive the experience. 
all this said though, despite the improvement in results or drastic improvements in the results today, they haven't changed anything physically on the boat and I would still be worried with Ineos about their low speed um, performance on the foils. They seem tacking in the pre-start to really suffer anywhere below 22 knots, 21 knots. They're getting sketchy for staying on the foils. Whereas we've seen Emirates, Team New Zealand, France, um, Luna Rossa, all getting down into kind of like 17, 18 knots and staying on the foil. I don't think that's a capability any of us have. Finally, we discussed on an earlier like post-racing analysis about an interesting situation where the winners of the round robin gets to pick their semi-finalists. I think at that time I said that Luna Rossa may want to pick Ineos to race in the semi-final so they don't give them too much time to improve and would rather face them earlier before they've improved. Based on today's performance, I think that that ship has sailed and Ineos have already you know, begun to find their groove. I think if I was Luna Rossa now, I would just take the easiest opponent in the semi-finals, get through that, and then, um, you know, just hope Ineos get knocked out um, in light conditions by American Magic in the other semi-final. Um, but yeah, interesting times. That's my take on today. Um, yeah, more of it tomorrow. Fingers crossed. Take care. See you around.